two, one. Welcome everyone to another episode of A Better Place. Um, we have a very interesting topic today. We're going to talk about exercising with type 1 diabetes with our guest, uh, Ben Graves. Uh, also, Dr. Trey Martin is going to be joining us also on this. And we look forward to having um, a great discussion about this and help the people of Orlando who may be dealing with type 1 diabetes to what, what's the best approach to exercise about this. So let me introduce our guest, Ben Graves. He is the owner of My House Fitness and in the college park. Uh, he's a personal trainer, a business owner, and a husband and a father. He started in the fitness business roughly in 2012, and he's grown passionate about serving clients who deal with obstacles such as type 1 diabetes and hyperthyroidism. His passion is from his own journey um, in life where he's had to implement these same impediments and still able to lose 100 pounds dealing with um, type 1 diabetes. So um, welcome, everyone. And I'm glad to introduce Ben Graves to join the podcast. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So let's get started. Um, so for our audience and to some of our followers, um, what exactly is type 1 diabetes? Because most people hear diabetes and they think of type 2. But can we get a clean kind of definition for some of our people? Um, what is type 1 diabetes? Sure. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune reaction that attacks the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. And insulin is a hormone that we need in our bloodstream to help unlock the energy um, from glucose uh, into our cells. So it's kind of like a key uh, for to open the door into our cells for our cells to be able to use the glucose that's in our blood for energy, right? So without that, um, the blood stays, or the, the glucose would just stay in the bloodstream without getting into the cells. And that, uh, that glucose sort of acts like little uh, kind of shards of glass, I guess, is the, the uh, analogy that I've been given by my doctors. And it causes damage if it's unused, um, that energy. Uh, the, the, the glucose ends up uh, causing damage to the little blood vessels, um, and then, of course, that just compounds into bigger tissues and organs, and that's where you end up with complications over time. Yeah, and pretty much whether it's type 2 or type 1, the effects of diabetes is uh, a major health problem in our uh, society on so many levels, just having those higher amounts of glucose and unregulated glucose levels, that leads to a major problem. But when did you first experience this? Is this something that you felt as a kid, as a teenager, as more of a young adult? What, what did you go through that led you to this point where you consulted with a doctor and you found out you had type 1 diabetes? Right. That's a, a great distinction, too, when you talk about the differences between type 1 and type 2. Um, type 1 diabetes being a, an autoimmune disease is triggered by some incident. So I was really lucky. I didn't have um, you know, scarlet fever or a lot of big, you know, illnesses when I was, when I was growing up. So even though it's, um, and it used to be called juvenile diabetes, they've kind of moved away from that term because people later in life can get it. And again, I was lucky to get it. Um, I want to say lucky might not be the right term, but, um, I was, I got it when I was uh, 26, just after my 26th birthday. Interesting. And we had a big bash and I had already been, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the symptoms, but, uh, that, that led up to it, but it was that 26th birthday party that kind of tipped the scales on some of those symptoms really presenting, uh, as something that I, I felt like I should go see a doctor about. So, um, I had already lost a bunch of weight. Um, and I had my, uh, so I had lost hundred pounds after, after basically in college and, and then just after, um, so I had been in pretty good shape and had my, my, uh, my, my diet, you know, relatively in order for a healthy person. Um, but I was probably walking around about 175 pounds at that time in my life in my early twenties. And over the period of like my, you know, mid twenties, like 24 to 25, I started to lose some, you know, some more weight. And I thought that my metabolism was just kind of kicked in high gear. Cause I was, you know, kind of a runner. Um, and, but then I started to really experience some significant weight loss. So I got down to about 145 pounds. I was eating in excess of, you know, five, 7,000 calories a day. 
Um, I started to. What type of runner were you? Were you just running two to three miles a day, or were you doing like five Ks, ten Ks, like training yeah, hard? I mean, my, yeah. So I was I was um, pretty accomplished in like the five K circuits, right? So yeah. I would run longer than that, um, but I wasn't like I come from marathons. My brother and my father are marathoners, and I was you know maybe it's because I was heavy when I was growing you know growing up I just never saw myself as that kind of distance you know I would only run up to maybe you know 10 or 13 miles at the most I think that's the most I've ever run is 13 miles um but I ran a lot of 5k's but I was putting in you know still in that like 15 to 20 you know maybe 25 miles a week so I mean it was it was a it was avid but not like extreme at that point in my life um but every day running every day um but I was losing more weight than I should you know, given that I was only running, you know, three to five miles a day and, um, you know, taking in 7,000 calories, that just doesn't parse yeah. out. So, um, but again, I was in my mid twenties and didn't really know any better. So that just being one symptom was like, okay, well, I can eat whatever I want. Maybe I've got a tapeworm, but this feels great. Um, <laughs> and so um, then I started to get, you know, more fatigued, the frequent urination, just insatiable hunger and thirst. You're just, you're drinking, you know, all that you can, and you actually, you crave more sugar. So I'm drinking, you know, even though I was, I didn't grow up, you know, really craving sugary drinks. I found myself drinking orange juice and soda pop full, um, you know, uh, full sugar Coca-Cola, which is, you know, just not something that I was used to doing. But again, it's like, okay, I don't know. Uh, it's it's kind of, it's tough because you got a ticket to ride to eat whatever you want. And you, when, since I had grown up being a fat kid, I was like, this is kind of cool. Um, but then I started to go blind. That's one of the things that was, that was really a, a tough one for me because um, I grew up, I also have bad ears, completely un, unrelated. Mm -hmm. But my, my eyesight has always been um, something I'm, you know, really proud of. So when that started to go, I was like, I got to go see somebody. What that ends up being is, you end up with so much sugar in your system that um, your your uh, your eyeball fills up with sugar alcohols, and so you get uh, eventually you you would get like retinopathy, that sort of thing. This is more of an acute um, issue that's that that you know after yeah. you get your sugars under control, which happened after I was diagnosed, that ended up going away. It was just a temporary thing, but it was certainly scary at the time. So you know, dropping about thirty pounds in a year, um, super fatigued. The, the blindness. Um, finally, I ended up, uh, up going in, in, in to see the doctor. So at that point, I was seeing a doctor who just happened to, he, he's not an endocrine, he was my primary care physician, but he happened to be um, kind of specializing in, in diabetes. He had a lot of type 2 diabetic clients, a couple of type 1 diabetic clients. So when I went in there, the first thing that he did was test my blood sugar. Um, and What was your blood sugar? It was 573, which is um, that's pretty darn high, right? Yes. So you, you want to be in the 60 to like 120 range. So 573 yeah. um, is pretty close to coma. There are people who, who, who would go into a coma or, um, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is basically where your, your kidneys start to shut down and, and, and your body starts to, to shut down. So you can go into a coma. Um, I wasn't, so I was fortunate in that way. And, um, so, uh, and he was sure, he was like, okay, yeah, you're diabetic. And I was like, that's impossible. I'm in great shape. He's like, no, I think you're probably type one diabetic. Again, I was like, I, I doubt it. I need a second opinion. He's like, well, you're welcome to get a second opinion, but this is the reality of it. It took a little, you know, it took some time to sink in, in that moment. Um, but he, it, it's funny because the sobering thing, when I was in there, he said, well, when you first walked in here, I thought that you had AIDS. So it's good that you don't have AIDS because I had thrush also. If you know what that is, it's yeah. a, uh, like a yeast infection in your mouth. And he says, uh, oftentimes, you know, as an older doctor, he'd been through a lot of the AIDS epidemic. That was oftentimes like a, a key uh, indicator for, for patients that he had seen coming in with. Um, you know, wow, like, interesting. I was like, well, okay, I don't have that. That's good. And he said, but actually we have to test and see if you have pancreatic cancer because that could also be, you know, because it would present the same way. If your whole pancreas is shutting down, then it would, yeah. it would present in, in, in the blood sugar. Anyhow, it would present, you know, the same way as that little, because there's a, a, a little piece of your pancreas, I should, I should say, um, that creates those islet cells. Um, 
and that's what creates the, the hormone insulin, right? So the autoimmune response that you have is um, when your, your T cells, um, your, uh, the, the cells that, that, that are, are your uh, immune system cells, they have sort of a malfunction and they attack those cells in your pancreas, pancreas uh, called your islet cells um, as a malfunction. And so um, anyhow, I said, you, you might have pancreatic cancer. We have to check and see if there's a tumor on there. So I went from kind of being, woe is me, I've got diabetes to being, man, I hope it's diabetes in like 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was my story. I mean, and I see it, you know, of course I, I train a lot of diabetics and I, I do consider myself lucky and blessed that I didn't have to go through it, that my parents didn't have to go through it when I was younger, because that can be terrifying for them. But then also that I didn't have to deal with it through adolescence, because I find that that's a really tough road um, yeah. for, for type 1 diabetics, because they they have all kinds of other hormones that are, are um, you know, overlaying challenges for them. They're going through puberty, their body's, you know, growing. Um, and then they also have all of, all of their social um, influences that, that might kind of lead them astray or pressure them to rebel. And the tough thing about diabetes is you're not, like when you do rebel, you're rebelling against your body. You think you're rebelling against your parents or you think that you're rebelling against the establishment, but really you're the only person yeah. that, that yeah. kind of has that consequence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, let's stay on this. I mean, this is a fascinating stuff. Trey, do you have any questions or thoughts on that? Um, given that he was roughly 26 and that's when he really got his diagnosis and some of those symptoms. Yeah. It kind of freaks me out because I turned 27 tomorrow. So I thought I was in the clear on type one diabetes. I thought, ah, oh, you know, it's uh, typically it was like 18 is kind of normally the range to see it and I was curious you mentioned your 26th birthday that you felt like that really like set it off for you what was it about that birthday party that you think really kind of kick-started it yeah so um we traditionally would go out to the beach with a bunch of families um around Labor or not really, not really, <clears throat> Memorial Day and my birthday kind of falls in it's the end of May so we would just always celebrate my birthday not necessarily on my birthday proper but on that weekend, usually like the Saturday of that weekend. And it was a big shindig out at the beach with a bunch of families. And so we would have, well, you know, you got families out at the beach, you're eating, you know, chips and trash and, you know, puppy chow and Chex Mix and m and m <laughs> and whatever. Um, and so for the, the birthday night, there would oftentimes be a, a, like a smorgasbord of different confections as well. And mm -hmm. um, so there's ice cream and I remember this, um, this ring of cheesecake that my mom got that was all <laughs> different flavored cheesecakes. And so of course I had to try every flavor and there was probably, you know, it was a variety pack. So it was like probably five different kinds of cheesecake that made up 25 pieces. So I probably had five pieces of cheesecake that day. Uh -huh. And then, so that, that threw my blood sugar up. Wow. Then, yeah. Yeah. So that probably threw my blood sugar from, I mean, who knows, um, but up to in, in the 500s. And then over the next couple of days, I just felt kind of really fluey. I was like, man, I just feel like I got, you know, the stomach, you know, flu or something like that. And of course you're, when you're eating that much and you're not, um, you're not processing that glucose and really processing a lot of that food for the nutrients that make it up, then your gut biome is toast as well. So I was having like, I don't know, half a dozen bowel movements a day because it's got to go somewhere right so yeah. i'm not eating any of so if you, then i thought i sort of had the stomach flu and um yeah so it was that was the catalyst was just all of that sugar that you take in from not just one night not just like one piece of birthday cake it was just a complete you know diabetic storm <laughs> uh, comedy of errors yeah how long did it take them from that initial meeting with your primary care to give you a diagnosis? Like how long did it take them to rule out pancreatic cancer and AIDS and stuff? Yeah, again, so he ruled out AIDS pretty much immediately. And I could do that for him because I wasn't exactly, <laughs> I wasn't exactly promiscuous. So <laughs> it would have had to been like, you know, I, I sat on a needle or something like right. that. Um, but I knew that that most likely was not the case. Um, but again, since he had, he had, uh, an older doctor that had had, you know, several diabetic clients, I, I couldn't have asked for a better scenario in that moment for, for having a, 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 a 
PCP that really just very pragmatically, like this is what it is, where they admitted me to the hospital that day because my mm -hmm. blood sugar, again, would have suggested that I should have, should be in a coma and I needed to go into all of the insulin therapies immediately. But also, since you're in that sort of brittle state, um, if they bring you down too fast, you know, you can go the other way, right? Because you don't, they don't know how insulin sensitive. Um, oh, the yeah. Like, mm -hmm. so, so I was lean at the time. I had, you know, a relatively good diet other than in, in those, you know, a couple of weeks uh, where things were really ramping up where my, where I was just kind of like eating, you know, wherever, you know, whatever I wanted because my body was craving it. Um, but I was coming from a pretty good base and I wasn't like super overweight. So I am, I was, and continue to be um, really on, on the upper scale of insulin sensitivity. So mm. a couple of units of insulin, like for me now, compared to maybe a, uh, another person, and it could be mass, it could, there's just a lot of things that, 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 that go mm. into that, but um, they needed to get my, my, my ratios in order. So there's, of course, the insulin therapies um, that they have to put me through um, to get me back stable, but then also immediately put me into training because you're only in the hospital for a day or two and then you're off on your own. And so um, they started a regimen of, uh, of education like right away. They had, like I, I was at um, Orlando Health uh, uh, at the time. And I'm sure that all, all hospitals have somebody that comes around and it's a, you know, a diabetic nutrition counselor that kind of explains all the things about how insulin works, its relationship to the food you take in um, and then, you know, after that, it's, it's, it's kind of up to you. I mean, there's, yeah. there's some support you can, they encourage you to, to, um, to go to like a, it's, it's like a, a meeting, uh, for diabetic training a couple of times, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as a residual, uh, support system. So I think it was like, after that three days, I think I went like every week for a month. Um, and then if you want more then of course you can kind of tap into that, but, yeah. um, yeah, so. <clears throat> I was going there also, Trey, I was thinking about that same thing. I was like, man, what caused this? Mm -hmm. And like, we've had the functional medicine physician on too, and their whole concept is solving the root cause and looking at like epigenetics is what were you exposed to that activated the gene that caused your immune system to attack your own body, thus your pancreas. And like, that's some fascinating stuff, but that's another, that's a whole nother lecture. Like if you ever read the book, the China study, uh, he goes in, he goes into looking at animal based protein. He used casein, which is in cow's milk or right. dairy. A lot of physicians will say dairy could be that. Now that's mm -hmm. still a theory and they're trying to prove it and stuff, but that's an interesting topic of what were you exposed to from like 15 to 25 that, may have caused this to have that immune system attack its own body and stuff. And so, yeah, so my, my opinion, I mean, I, I, I've heard of that with, uh, with, with, with milk uh, and there are a couple of different components there um, and theories behind like the, the hormones that are, that are in milk now. And maybe the reason our kids yeah. are so much than they were 50 years ago, um, hormones and everything that we're eating. Um, so I was lacto like aggressively lactose intolerant when I was a baby oh. and I didn't. And, and so my parents just, you know, basically stopped feeding me milk when I was younger, uh, because it would cause, you know, diarrhea all, and rashes, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I was the kid who poured water on my cereal, you know, <laughs> uh, we didn't have almond milk back then. Almond. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We didn't have any of that. It was just milk or water. So I was the water kid. I didn't know any better. It tasted fine. So then I started. <laughs> Um, I actually started drinking milk later in life because it didn't have the same trouble in my yeah. gut. So who knows, maybe that could have helped to trigger it or I don't know, help, but, you know, cause, you know, to trigger it. Um, there, from what they understand, there has to be some genetic precursor, however. So the mm -hmm. caveat there is that there is, there is, I think almost always, I'll say almost because, you know, science is always changing. And it's been a minute since I've read mm -hmm. something, but it used to be, it's pretty linear on that uh, type one di diabetes um, <clears throat> genetic uh, uh, predisposition. Yeah, exactly. So, like for instance, I had a coworker at my last office job who was type one diabetic. Her mother was type one diabetic. 
her daughter is type one diabetic and her two daughters are type one diabetic, completely linear and only in the females in that family, right? So for whatever their, you know, genetics parse out, yeah. then that's how, how, that's how it works in their family. Whereas yeah. for me, we, I have a, a second cousin um, or maybe a first cousin once removed, my mom could tell you, um, that had type one diabetes. And so, you know, if, if yeah. it was, if it was linked to that or if it was linked to this, um, it'll be interesting to see the future of treatments since we know we can map out the human genome. Can they turn off that switch? And then will stem cells cure this disease if they could do that? Or will the body just keep on attacking it? But that's a whole nother question. So that's a whole nother conversation. Let's, let's go back to when you got diagnosed. Right. So what was treatment like? And did you have to make dietary changes going forward to still be active? Was it just insulin or did they put you on anything else with treatment and medication wise? Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. So we'll start with the insulin thing. Um, and I, so the contemporary medicine now has changed a little bit. So it'll, 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 um, so I can sort of, um, explain it in that way. When I, when I was first diagnosed, basically everybody was on a long acting insulin, um, and a short acting insulin. And so what those two things do is emulate what a functional pancreas will do to keep a person's blood sugar stable. That's what the long mm -hmm. acting insulin does. So like your pancreas is always kind of dripping a little bit of insulin just to make up for your basal metabolic rate. Maybe some of the glycogen stores that you have from what you ate yesterday or the day before, you know, your print, your, your, the proteins and the fats in your, in your, uh, in your gut are always going into your liver and then they have, they end up that, that energy goes out into your blood in the form of glucose eventually. Right. So that little basal drip is what your pancreas is doing now that mine doesn't. Right. But yeah. then the reactive um, bolus that I would do if I'm going to take a, like if I'm going to take in insulin in insulin. And for me, my ratio is 15 grams of carbohydrates for one unit of insulin. Right. So if I'm going to eat 30, gar 30 carbs for lunch, I would take, you know, my, my little vial and needle and stick in and do two units of insulin, right? So that would be my ratio for 30 carbs. Um, and then my long acting insulin is, is working all the time. Um, the issue with that, of course, with the long acting insulin is that's always on board, right? So if you decide, I'm going to go take a run, your pancreas says, okay, I'm going to take a break, right? And so it stops, um, it stops basically creating that insulin drip because it knows that your blood sugar is going to sort of want to drop over time as you're using your glycogen stores through whatever exercise that is a run a circuit training mm -hmm. pick up basketball that sort of thing if i have that long acting insulin on board it's on board no matter what so then i have to take in carbohydrates to make up for it because that that ship has sailed i'm 18 hours into a 24 hour cycle that i'm going to repeat again right before i go to bed and take in my my long acting insulin so um, so to, I guess, sort of combat that, um, there's the, the insulin pump, right? So I have since gone on the insulin pump and that has programmed basal rates. So if I'm going to just have a normal day, I have a basal rate set it, it's about, it's 0.75 units per hour, but that's, um, <clears throat> gives me about 18 units, 20 units of insulin a day, which is the same as the long acting insulin that I was taking before but I can shut it off. So it's like, I'm, if I'm going to go mow the lawn, I can reduce that rate of, 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 the, uh, of the basil. And then if I want to um, take a bolus, instead of having to go into the refrigerator, get my vial of insulin and my needle, mm -hmm. stick it in my belly, I just press a couple buttons. So, you know, the travel with the insulin pump is a lot easier. Um, and then of course that variability that I have to um, contend with, with exercise, um, also makes it a lot more manageable mm -hmm. um, you know, for that for that reason. What type of macros do you find kind of keeps you relatively balanced? Like, is there a certain proportion that works a little bit better for you? Sure, right. For me, I, I, I tend to be pretty protein heavy. Um, and of course, there's no free rides. Um, but my, my macros are, um, are in like the, probably like the zone diet you know, but maybe closer to like 35% carbohydrates, 45% protein, and then the rest at, at a fat. 
Um, I'm still afraid of fat because I grew up in the 90s. Um, <laughs> so, and I know that it doesn't make any sense, but I do know that fat satisfies. So I've been able to, to, to reprogram my behaviors, but there's always this little you know, devil on my shoulder saying yeah. that fat is evil. And I know that that's not true. And I really know that fat is more satisfying. It, it, it's better for me as a diabetic because it's a lot easier for me to take in that fat and use that for energy because the, the, the response is a little bit slower. Again, there are no free rides. There's something called gluconeogenesis. Have you ever heard of that? Um, basically that your body will just produce glucose somehow or find a way? Well, yeah, from, from protein or fat sources, usually more from protein, which is like, if, um, it's, it's become a hot word in, uh, in the ketogenic age now because people are taking in too much protein on the keto diet and they're finding that they're, they're, they're jumping out of ketosis because the protein that they're taking in is converting eventually into glucose. Now, for me, since I'm not trying to, you know, manage my weight with my diet and, it, you know, for the, you know, the protein, I, I you know, do just do calories and, and, and macros. I'm not yes. on a ketogenic diet, but I still have the same sort of negative uh, uh, response because I have to, I have to compensate with a bolus, but it, yeah. but it's not, it's, it's more reactive. And sometimes I have to think back, like, what did I do 12 hours ago that would make my blood sugar be up? It's like, oh, I took in 75 grams of protein and, and my blood sugar was stable for a long time. And then, and then it starts to climb up once my, once, once my liver does its job. Um, yeah. So I was I, going there too. Yeah, again, yeah. what's that? I was going there too, Trey. I was like, okay, what happens if you eliminate sugar? Sure. I was like, I wonder if he ever got in true ketosis what happens then and then what if he goes on an atkins diet and just eats protein and fat but have you ever tried that and then that concept of gluconeogenesis meaning the body will break down some material to form glucose that's fascinating stuff yeah yeah so i have gone so low carb that i'm definitely r running on like a low carb diet um you know maybe getting 10 percent of my my energy from carbs um but the fat component has never been something that i've been able to get because you got to get like 70 percent of your energy from, from fat to be in true ketosis yeah to, to be in true ketosis right so the tough thing about it is if i'm in ketosis um and i have been i mean i've i've, I've been there um of course you can go into ketoacidosis when you're a when when you're a diabetic and there's no like you're if you use the little pea strips, ketoacidosis and ketosis present the same way, but one is a, 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 a diabetic emergency and the other one's just a cool diet, right? So a lot of healthcare practitioners don't encourage um, their uh, patients to go in, go on a keto diet just because if, they, if you go into a, a ketoacidosis, you may not know the difference, right? So, um, and the difference could be if I go to, um, you know, racetrack and get a diet Mountain Dew and they filled the thing, uh, uh, you know, they hooked it up to regular Mountain Dew and instead of taking in zero calories and, and zero carbohydrates, I took in, you know, 500 calories and 70 carbohydrates and didn't know any better. Um, and for somebody who's lean, that could, that, you know, that, that could throw you right into DKA pretty quickly. So, um, Again, I've, I've done a lot of really high protein diets because especially when I was bulking, right? Um, there was a, a period of time where I was really trying to get, you know, strong and be more of a bodybuilder a few years ago. And I got myself up into like the 190 range. I walk around again, like 170 right now. Um, and 20 pounds of muscle takes a lot of calories, right? And, I, um, and so I was taking in a lot of calories and I didn't wanna have all those carbohydrates. And again, being afraid of fat, I was just taking in tons of protein. Um, yeah. You know, and protein is almost, it's, it's the freest of the calories. It's, it's the freest of the, um, of the macronutrients being that like, when you eat fat, you know it's basically gonna convert to energy of course, carbohydrates are going to convert to energy. So if you're eating too much carbohydrates and fat, you're, if you're at a surplus, then you're just going to gain weight. Protein is a little bit more complicated. So especially if it's a lean protein, 
a lot of times your body will get rid of what it can't use, or it takes so much for your body to process it in digestion that you get, you don't yield the same amount of energy from those calories. Yeah. You're at a little bit of a surplus with, pro with protein being what's making you at the surplus. I have experienced that it's not, it's not as, um, you're not going to gain as much weight in the short term as if you just like, you know, eating fries yeah. and cheese. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what's your daily like? What's your daily day like? Uh, are you constantly measuring your, your insulin and glucose levels daily? Do you space your meals out differently around workouts? Like what's your average day like? Right. What are you doing diet wise, meal wise? Do you measure glucose constantly before and after meals, before and after workouts? What's your day look like? Yes, that's a great question. I, um, so I talked about the insulin pump. Another piece of technology that I was able to um, ad adopt um, is called a continuous glucose monitor. Oh, that's and awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, so I have. Um, I, we are, I think we are definitely geeks. I was like a continuous glucose monitor. That's cool. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's, telling, it's sending a signal all the nice. time. I have a, a piece of equipment. It's actually like on my buttocks, so I'm not going to show it to the camera. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're welcome. That's funny. <laughs> not that kind of show. Um, yeah. <laughs> not the internet, but so they, we, um, so I, I guess Actually, one of my di type one diabetic clients was on a continuous glucose monitor early in the CGM days. And she was like, you got to try this. You got so and she was a, actually a nurse, too. And she became, um, a, a, I guess, a, a rep for one of those companies. But at the time, she was just like really jazzed about it. So she was able to get me one for a trial. And it was a total game changer because instead of having to, to check my blood sugar, um, you know, I was checking it between five and 10 times a day. My insurance allowed me seven, you know, so on my more sedentary days, I try to keep it, you know, in the four to five range so that if I'm out golfing, I can check it every hour. Or if I'm, you know, going to be doing, you know, some sort of physical event or having a, you know, it, it, that balance is, 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 you know, kind of scary to think about back in the day, budgeting those, those times yeah. that I was check my blood sugar, but now it's every five minutes I get a, I get a, a blood sugar reading. It shows me where I'm trending. So um, I've got a, 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 a connection through my watch that goes to my phone and my phone has the software that, that receives the information from the, the transmitter um, that is a little, um, it's like, a, uh, well, it's a little Bluetooth um, transmitter, but from there, there's a sensor that goes into my subcutaneous tissue um, about maybe a half of an inch. It's a little, little gold wire that goes in there and it gives me, it's, they're pretty darn accurate nowadays. Um, nice. so I'm, so I don't have to really, I mean, barring every once in a while, it, it, everything malfunctions because it's technology and they're still, you know, working on it, but that's not as much of an issue anymore. Um, it used to be that I would have to, to test it, test my blood sugar twice a day to calibrate it. And now they're accurate enough that, I mean, Sometimes you can tell it if it's really going off the rails, but otherwise it's something I just trust. And that's one, one less thing I have to think about. So in the morning, I wake up in the morning, I look at my blood sugar. Usually it's in, it's in good shape. Um, if it's not, then I, you know, either pause my, uh, basal rate or I, I, uh, do a, you know, a bolus just to correct. Let's say if I wake up and my blood sugar is 130, that's not terrible, but I want to bring it down to about hundred, right? So I'll take like a third of a unit just to get myself going. Um, my normal day, um, I am kind of like an inter intermittent fasting. Um, it's not really deliberate. It's just the way that my day goes. I, I, I put a scoop of vegan protein powder in some cold coffee and shake it up. And then that, I just drink that on my way to work. I get the caffeine in my system so I can be excited for my clients when I get into, <laughs> get into work. Oftentimes I end up with a break in my mid morning for a workout. So if I'm working out somewhere between nine and about 11 AM, if I feel hunger pangs, then I'll have like a little low carb bar to kind of nibble on, but I'm basically still running semi fasted. Um, and again, it used to be that I would have to look at my blood sugar. Um, like if I would go to the gym, if I was taking my, uh, taking my blood sugar manually, I would, you know, let's say that it was a, a hundred. I would say, okay, well, I have a bunch of uh, slow-acting insulin on board. 
I'm going to take in 15 or 30 carbohydrates, cross my fingers, go work out and, and, and see how I feel. And sometimes I, you know, end up taking my blood sugar after a workout and I'm in the fifties, which is not great. And sometimes it would be in the one fifties and I wouldn't really understand why. Um, and, and, you know, because again, my blood sugar can be reacting from a glycogen stores level from what I've eaten over the past day or two. There's the carbohydrates that you're eating that are fast um, that you're accounting for, but also, you know, you're having to account for things that you've eaten so long ago that you don't want to think about it. Right. So it was a lot of, a lot of guessing. So now that I'm able to look at my watch, look at my phone every five minutes, it's a lot easier to kind of tell where things are going when I'm, when I'm working out. Um, and then I eat lunch usually at about three. Um, it's usually a pretty, pretty low carb lunch. Um, cause I find if I'm, if I'm taking in a lot of carbohydrates and I also have to take in a lot of insulin, insulin is a horage, it's a horage, a storage hormone. Um, and it tends to kind of like slow my, my energy down. I've got a couple of young kids that I'm trying to chase around for the rest of the evening. So I don't want to mm -hmm. be really bogged down with a lot of carbohydrates. So I still take in the bulk of my calories at night, like after 6 PM, I just start grazing. I have a good, good dinner and then ice cream every single night. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question about fasting, Trey? Uh, well, I was just kind of curious if you have seen a range of blood sugar level that feels the best for you. Like, are you trying to keep it pretty much 80 to 120 all day? And do you want to let it spike a little bit before a workout or do you try to keep it kind of in a normal baseline? Yeah, I find that if I, if I let it spike before a workout, it's only if I'm going to be doing like a really long cardio like group fitness kind of workout. Um, like for instance, I was with my brother up in Chicago and, uh, this past weekend and, uh, we do a, a pretty intense, it's a, uh, it's a free, uh, it's called the November project. It's like a tribe that just meets, you know, downtown and it can be 20 or 30 people, 40 people. Um, oftentimes I'll, I'll let it go ahead and cruise up, you know, maybe even up to 200. And my doctor has said, that's great. That's fine. But inevitably, even if I turn my insulin off, um, it's usually like normal 70 by the time I'm done with that hour or hour and 15 minutes of intense work. Um, if I can help it, I try not to do that, which is why I'm, I mean, I would, I know that in the long term, I'm more comfortable with keeping it in that 80 to 120. So mm -hmm. I own a gym, so I can control a lot of my variables. So right now I'm, I, I, I want to celebrate that because I'm not always going to own a gym. And maybe it's not always going to be that simple for me. So, um, so yeah, I, I do a lot of my, like I time out my cardio where I'm doing, uh, you know, like a 10 minute warm up, and then I'll do more strength work. And then I'll check my, you know, basically look at my phone, check my blood sugar, make sure everything's still okay, like 40 minutes later. Um, and then I'll do 20 minutes of, of cardio. That mm -hmm. tends to keep things the most consistent where I'm staying right in that 80 to, to 120 range. Um, so consistency is key. It's super boring, but you know, it's a first world problem. I'll take it. Do you do any, uh, like post-workout wise, do you ever do like a little bit of an insulin bump so you can get that anabolic nature of the storage of the insulin hormone with a little protein powder, drive it in, get yourself super jacked or. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> question. Yeah, you, so I don't have to do that as much anymore because I'm not lifting as heavy. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, and we can talk more about what my, what my daily regimen is, or I can jump, you know, sort of jump into what my workouts look like. Um, but a few years ago when I told you I was, you know, trying to bulk, mm -hmm. I definitely took advantage of that. And what happens is you, yeah, you get that glycogen response, um, from the adrenaline dump that you get when you're lifting heavy weights, right? So if I'm lifting at my 85, you know, if I'm doing, uh, you know, 80, 85%, uh, one rep max for threes or fives or whatever. I'm doing doing that powerlifting range, that that one or two to five rep range. Then my blood sugar would usually want to cruise up a little bit, right? So then I would take in um, a little bit of insulin, and of course that's a storage hormone, so that's gonna that's gonna help. Um, the, again, there's no free rides, so that that uh, muscle glycogen that's, that's dumping into my blood is then depleted. 
So on the back end of that, I'm probably going to have to take carbs in to make up for it, even though I've only adjusted for my for my uh, for the the blood sugar rise from the from the glycogen or from the, the from the muscle glycogen response as they um, get uh, re you know uh, get get refilled. There's going to be some sort of response, either a, 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 a dump in my blood sugar or another glycogen uh, dump, um, because that's another kind of strange malfunction with, uh, with type 1 diabetics that I was explained early by my doctor, is when your blood sugar goes up, when your blood sugar goes up, your body reacts by giving you insulin. And there's a strange phenomenon in type 1 diabetics um, where when our blood sugar goes up, our body can't release insulin, but it wants to do something. So it will release glucagon into, in, into our system from our liver, mm-hmm. which makes your blood sugar redouble, right? So, um, cause it wants to do something. So, and, and, it, and it doesn't know what to do. So it oh. just, you know, the other thing that it, that mm-hmm. it can't. So like, if you're like, if you're bonking and really me too, if you're bonking, uh, let's say you're on like a, on a long bike ride or whatever in your body, doesn't have the mu- muscle glycogen to give, um, and you don't have anything in your tummy, mm. your body will re- release glucagon from your liver um, to, to, to help combat that low blood sugar. Um, again, mine does that too, but it also does that my blood sugar is high. So yeah. again, the, so the, the insulin response thing, the manual insulin response thing, <clears throat> like I can't quantify what my body's going to do. So it, th- th- that was always a fun kind of experiment when I was when I was working on bulking um yeah do you take metformin yeah what's that do you take metformin at all I don't um but I know that a lot of type 2 diabetics do um I've heard and read a lot about uh the metabolic uh advantages you know for for taking metformin I think it's there's a lot of, um, I mean, I've read that there's, there, there, there's a lot of um, studies out there that show advantages for life extension. Um, I, I, I don't take it. Um, I yeah. talked to my doctor about maybe getting on it. It's kind of tough for a diabetic who's type one to also get on a metformin when they're otherwise, because he's just trying to, you know, hone in on treating the disease. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot of autonomy in my care. However, with this doctor, because I do pretty well, my, my A1C is always you know, in, in, in the fives, um, but that hasn't been one that he uh, encourages yet. But I, I, I've read, I, mean, I, I assume that that's why you ask. Um, yeah. Great. Can you explain what metformin is for some people who don't know what it is and why you asked that question? I will, I'm really asking the question just because uh, I, I feel like we're kind of dancing around like longevity topics and I'm always right. interested and like uh living for long periods of time so my kind of two-part thought is like if you i think continuous glucose monitoring is going to become a ubiquitous tool in people that want to live for a long period of time um because for me i have no idea what my blood sugar is ever so is there an advantage of like me staying at that 80 to 120 i'd feel more energized i think the knowledge type 1 diabetics gain from self-treating is very powerful as far as health and wellness goes so i'm curious if like if all of us had some idea of what our blood sugar was kind of like i my pulse is on my whoop strap right now i always know what my my resting pulse is i know all the data on my sleep so if i knew my sugar levels too could i optimize that take something like metformin and kind of put all that together in a way that's advantageous um obviously doing uh i hate needles so doing what you do with type of <laughs> diabetes is not anything i want to do but the knowledge we gain from what you guys deal with is really interesting from a longevity standpoint um especially when you add in like fasting and metformin and all that stuff to the equation um i think that's kind of where i'm angling the question with on that um my limited i have a limited understanding of metformin i've just seen like uh people talk about it from uh like tom bill you will talk about it on his show a lot or a, uh, I don't know if you watch health theory at all, but he has a lot of people on talking about longevity traits because he wants to live forever is what he says. So my understanding of it is it helps you stabilize your blood sugar and they're finding it has a nice side effect of maybe slowing down um, the, the aging cycle too. 
And I don't know why. I don't know if excessive sugar maybe leads to telomere shortening and that cellular it, damage right. that that's, we talked yeah, about that's earlier. Um, it helps to lengthen your telomeres. That's what I. That's what I've heard. And that's yeah. From Dr. Dr. Rhonda Patrick, which is she's all. Yeah. yeah. She's awesome. Rhonda Patrick's got some really good stuff too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, and I, I I totally agree with that. And and I do I do you know try to take every every blessing that I can. And I I I I. I did want to offer that yeah I, I i definitely appreciate the advantage that i have in having this data to process all of the time um that's um i mean it's a bummer that i have to but it's also really cool that i get to um and you know everything being a pragmatic you know conscious decision about i'm taking in x number of carbohydrates you know to this consequence or to what and it makes things more purposeful if i embrace it that way um, which again, I think is a good, um, a, a kind of a good segue into the way that, that technology has, has helped make diabetes, not more, not just more manageable, but also, um, you know, make it a way to, to keep track of our own, of our own health. That's something that a lot of my, my clients, um, who are type one diabetic, like if they're in their 30s or in their 40s, they grew up not being allowed to exercise, not being allowed to join team sports. Oftentimes their parents are terrified because you know the you'd rather keep your blood sugar a little bit high and deal with the consequences in the long term rather than have to have to suffer a low and maybe die. Right. So that was something that's just daily part of keeping, you know, keeping their child safe. And then as they grow up. You know, it's almost like a failure to, to, to launch in that way because they're, they're, they, they continue to be afraid, even though the, the technology continues to, uh, to advance. Like I still have clients who carry around, you know, juice boxes with 50 grams of carbohydrates in them instead of having just like, I treat low blood sugars with a four gram of sugar glucose tablet, one at a time. Right. So I know because I know that there's no free rides. Right. So I know that th those are calories. And if I take in 50 grams of carbohydrates and I only need 20 to get my blood sugar up from where yeah. I, from the danger zone, then I'm going to have to treat with insulin later. And that's a storage hormone. But if you're at a surplus that day, then it's going to convert that. <clears throat> energy to fat, right. So, um, yeah, it's 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 it's, uh, you know, using that information and the technology that we have in hand um, to not just be reactive and uh, help to manage crisis, but rather make it part of a business decision to manage our health in just yeah. another way, because some people have to wear contact lenses, you know, women have to deal with menstruation. It's just people have to do, do you know, do different things as part of the human condition. So I can't tell if all the tech is going to make us all paranoid all the time. Like I, I, I've had whoop strap for like three weeks now. Um, and I notice if I even have like two beers at dinner, my sleep and recovery goes down, heart rate variability, flat lines, respiratory rate goes up, pulse rate goes up. And I'm like, it's like two, two beers at dinner, nothing crazy. And I'm like, that's a pretty big effect. Like, so I don't know if having, too much data makes people like not live their lives, but I think we could all probably benefit from, I think a lot of us are riding in excess. We're always riding hot on sugar and storage. And if we knew like, Hey, it doubles my blood sugar to 225 or something. Um, obviously if you have a functioning pancreas, your insulin can deal with it, but would we have less chronic fatigue and less chronic disease if better sleep people knew? Yeah. They're not just riding this carbohydrate roller coaster. Um, and that's what's so yeah. tough too, you know, when you, t when you, you talk about intermittent fasting and most of, most people who are, who are, they, they, they will put their window where they're maybe doing fasted cardio in the morning and then pushing their lunch into that eight hour window. So they're eating something maybe a little bit lighter for lunch and then they're getting in the glut of their calories at night. Well, mm -hmm. if a glut of those calories come from carbohydrates, then it's going to affect your sleep, sleep for that entire first rhythm at least. And sometimes people don't budget themselves enough time to even get eight hours anyway. So if their first four hours, they're combating, um, they're combating that that uh, that glucose in their blood with a functioning or non-functioning pancreas. I mean, I still have to do it. Like if I eat a high carbohydrate 
I'm ex I, I can do on my, um, my insulin pump, I can program in what's called an extended bolus, which means I'm not bringing in all of that insulin now, but I know that, I, that it's going to convert to carbohydrates and energy in an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And again, that's conscious and I have the data and I'm still doing it because I want chicken wings and beer and French fries, you know, every once in a while. And so, mm -hmm. but I, but the difference is that I'm having to actually go in and say, okay, this is what I've done to myself, <laughs> you know, before I go to sleep. And, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to see just the little effects you were talking about. If you're, if you wanted to increase your blood sugar that you take this four gram tablet, I remember having a patient that his alarm and phone started going off and he, and I was like, what's that? He's like, my blood sugar is too low. And he just popped in a couple of Tic Tacs. Right. And it, yeah. and it actually brought him back up to normal. Yeah. And knowing that a couple of Tic Tacs could increase your blood sugar that much, imagine what a soda does. Yeah. It's like, it's like yeah. mind, so, mind boggling. It's like, wow, that's crazy. So if someone recently got diagnosed with type one diabetes and they're wanting to exercise, you know, um, where should they start their journey? journey do they go to their physician first they consult with an expert how do you recommend that they start their journey having type 1 diabetes but they want to stay active and live an active lifestyle or start exercising and there's only one way to go you have to get a diabetic personal trainer i'm just kidding um, <laughs> great sales pitch i like it there you go <laughs> um, no actually yeah, I, I i couldn't deal with all the diabetics who who, who need the help um, but you know again since a lot has changed um, I think, right. We, I, and, and of course I, I spoke to how, um, it was just this, like trying to keep yourself alive and survive and, you know, sort of kick the, kick, kick the can of fitness down the road because maybe someday, um, and it's not about being, you know, fit or being, um, or being, or feeling well, it's just about not dying today. Um, and they've had, you know, a lot of these kids, and you know, grownups have had this ingrained for decades, right? They're 40 years old and they've had it since they were two years old. And that's just, that's the way that they're, that they're programmed. Um, so certainly like, like um, I have found having, you know, taking a, a, a real, um, with a lot of my clients anyways, and I guess personally too, um, taking a real audit of your care. Um, if you are, um, if you've been diabetic for, you know, type one diabetic for a long time, then of course, take, you know, taking an audit of your care, talking to your physician, talking to your endocrinologist and saying like, okay, this is what I plan to do. What's your disposition on that? They're going to, the, the, you know, a good endocrinologist will talk about, um, you know, how brittle their condition is. Um, like if they've been mistreating their body for a long time, their A1 season, like the, the tens or the thirteens, which where it should be like, Yours is probably five, mine's in the five, four, whatever. Um, then your, your body might not be ready to do a real, um, you know, intense uh, regimen of exercise anyway. So, of course, you know, doing the, the, you know, taking the right steps with your physician first and getting kind of the, the clear about what, what they encourage and what they discourage. And if you don't like the information that they're giving, then don't be afraid to get a second opinion either, unless you really feel like you trust that doctor. Um, I mean, there's a lot of responsibility that we have to take into our own care. So, you know, we should always be skeptics in everything. Um, if we feel like we're getting, you know, sold a bill of goods, um, I just think that that's, that's the responsible thing to do. Um, but, you know, once we, you get the go ahead on what capacity your healthcare uh, professional thinks that you have, um, for exercise, it's basically, you know, establishing some goals, make them big, small, and daily. So like examples would be like a big goal. If I, if I know that I need to lose 50 pounds, it's probably my doctor and my wife who's encouraging me to do that. Um, and so that's a big nut to crack, right? So my small goal could be like, okay, if I want to do 50 pounds eventually, maybe I can lose 10 pounds in the next two months. And so Two months is still a long time and how am I going to lose 10 pounds in the next two months then your daily goals would be like um, you know observe a new exercise regimen and see how it's affecting my blood glucose levels right so um, I'm going to start walking uh, a mile a day every single day 
or say, I'm going to walk a mile a day, like make some manageable minimums. Like I'm going to walk a mile five days a week and it's going to be these days. I'm not going to kick it down the road. It's not going to be all five days a week. And then it gets to be Tuesday. Like, oh, there aren't five days left in the week. So I guess I'll only get four. Well, but I'm not going to start tomorrow. I'm going to start the day after that. And then you only did it twice. Right? So starting a real plan, making manageable minimums, saying I'm going to walk a mile every single day. Maybe I'm going to do, you know, three sets of 10 pushups on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three sets of sit-ups, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three sets of 20 air squats, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, make that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, non-negotiable. I'm going to walk the mile every day. I'm going to do these things, these three days. And then two weeks later, see how that affected where you were from two weeks ago. So you've been doing it wrong for 20 years. Now, you know, what did that do? How did that affect my blood sugar. As you start to lose weight, you become more insulin sensitive. So, you know, how is this affecting my blood sugar? Your metabolism actually goes up pretty, pretty quickly if you start to tax your body, start taxing your, your cardiovascular and muscular systems. So that acute difference is something that we can start keeping track of. And again, like, um, like Trey was saying, that onslaught of information, if we process the right, you know, components and don't get too much information overload, it can be empowering just making sure that we're, that we're paying attention to the things that make sense. Like for me, the things that my watch can tell me and your whoop strap can tell you, like I turn off the alarms for a bunch of the stuff, you know, like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to steps. I know I get plenty of steps and I don't want my watch telling me how many steps I got because it doesn't even work on any elliptical. So I don't want that to be a part of my data on slot. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, measuring data, most of us have jobs and expectations, you know, at those jobs. So we just want to, we want to look at fitness the same way, right? So like you have a job to do and you have expectations from your patients and clients, you have expectations from your coworkers. And so you check those boxes every day. And then at the end of the day, we don't want to just leave our body out of it, right? Because that's what's going to keep us going to, going to, to work the next day. So just adding that exercise regimen in to that layer of diabetic care, you know, because a lot yeah. of us, you know, we're, we're having to track those carbohydrates anyway. So just making another deliberate effort to, to tack on to that, um, I think is, is important. For yeah, that, perfect. Is there any other, is there any other resources, references, or websites that you would recommend beyond what their physicians would actually give them? Anything that you found that's Absolutely. useful? Yeah. So, so for me, I never tapped into a, a like a local, like a, a get together, you know, kind of thing, like a meetup. Um, I don't, I never felt like I needed that. I feel um, as though for me that that wasn't necessary. I do have actually, and I grew up with a couple of kids that were diabetic. And so them being type one diabe diabetic, now I sort of have those relationships and it's kind of funny anecdotes, you know, we sort of trade information back and forth. Now they were diabetic in elementary and, and, and high school. So that's fun. Um, and then, of course, for me, I also I'm, I'm able to, to mentor a lot of clients, so I get that outlet for myself. Um, but for me, and what I found, Facebook has more groups than you could ever imagine. Like, there's forums for every kind of angle that you can attack diabetes. Um, you know, there's parents groups, um, there's type one diabetes athletes groups, there's a Dexcom G6 group that just focuses on everything that's good and bad about CGMs. Like people, you know, talk about how they're using their CGM to help, you know, their, their diabetic journey, but they'll also complain about customer service, right? So um, mm -hmm. there's juvenile diabetes groups for people with juvenile diabetes and who are more involved in the research behind yeah. curing the disease. Um, I find the type one diabetics athletes group speaks most to me. Um, some of those groups, some of those support groups can also have a lot of like misinformation and melancholy and self pity um, because that's part of the human condition too. I can use, you know, I can, I can, I can, you know, feel, feel down about anything. Um, so, you know, and, and, and as part of that group, I want to be, you know, responsible to those people and encouraging, um, but sometimes you just have to kind of take, you know, yeah. take a step back and, and hide that person's posts because it's just not, not great, but that's with anything. But I, I, I mean, so Facebook is a great, a great place to start really for, yeah. for, um, for anybody who's, 
who's in need of support because from there there's layers of locality that kind of cascade down from the national you know scope down to oh hey there's people in a in a facebook meetup that that go to starbucks and get a skinny latte every yeah. thursday right so if you need that human condition condition so i mean social media is a great a great yeah great, right? yeah i think uh we're actually starting to run out of time, so I don't want to cut us off too early, but I think that the information that you presented today and telling your your story is going to help a lot of people out, even yeah. if it's just in the Orlando area um, or if people even watch this video throughout the whole U.S. or even the world. I think that knowledge is going to really help out and stuff. Like that. But we're not going to let you off that quick. you got to answer the Fab Five questions. Are you ready? I think so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's right okay so what book are you reading right now i just finished gwendy's button box from stephen king oh nice okay a little, a little novel just yep. just <laughs> number two what is your favorite restaurant around orlando it used to be rustique but they just shut down here in i know i can't believe that yeah. i think they moved I, actually they're still in they still have several locations they're awesome um I, I love the tap room. That's that's probably my go-to. Um, Dub's Dread. Dub's Dread, the tap room at Dub's Dread. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what's something new that you're doing that is trying to keep you healthy? Um, I, I guess you, you already said one, which is the glucose monitoring, but is there anything else, any kind of uh, something new that you're doing to keep you healthy? Right. Well, absolutely. Um, I, I'm 42 now, so I changed my, my regimen of um, like my heavy days uh, and my light days. I still do kind of bodybuilding splits because that's what I'm used to, like my chest, triceps and abs, my leg days and my, um, and, and my back and biceps days. Chest day is Monday, so I own a gym and I'm allowed to do that. Um, that's mm -hmm. always, the, always taken at the gym, so I'm allowed to do that now at my own place. But um, I have gotten a lot more involved with stretching and mobility working more through volume and mobility and sort of getting away from, from intensity, you know, I mean, I'm, my workouts are still pretty intense, but I'm not trying to be a world beater in my deadlift or, or anything like that anymore. Cause, um, I, I found that, that your muscles are pretty much ready deep into your sixties, but the joints and connective tissue don't love it as much. Um, yeah. you just can't, I can't get away with not warming up and doing the stretching and mobility. Um, and I just don't have, have the kind of time to, to pull myself into being able to just go pick up super heavy weight without doing the real work in the mobility. Um, so I've been really, really celebrating a lot of that lately. Yeah. Number four is, yeah. sorry, number four is how many hours of sleep do you get a night? Are you a four hour sleep guy? You're an eight hour one or you're a 10 hour one? Yeah. I used to be like, yeah, I used to be like a four or five hour guy, but now I'm finding that six to eight is, is great. So if I find, if I'm under six for two nights in a row, then I better find an, an eight hour night. Um, Cause I- Same here. I'm a, I'm a six to eighter. So as long as I get six to eight, I'm fine. Okay. I can function good and perform well. So um, last question, what's one thing in healthcare that you want to see changed? I would like for type one diabetes to be cured. <laughs> um, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that's, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of other of, of things that go into that, uh, you know, curing, curing the, the cause, you know, finding the gene and helping to switch that off, finding more, I mean, cause in a lot of ways I'm managing it. So I feel like it's almost cured for me anyways. Um, but for those yeah. people who can't manage it, yeah. Curing, curing diabetes would, uh, I think that we're on the forefront of a lot of technology behind that right now. So, yeah. um, there's uh, some, some really good research going on uh, behind alpha cell technology instead of beta cell technology <laughs> producing insulin. So that would be awesome. Very nice. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us on this. I think this is a great topic. It's going to help out a lot of people. If anyone around Orlando wants to find you, um, uh, how, how can they find you? Website, social media? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, my house fitness college park right now, um, we have a, uh, if you just Google college park, personal trainer, um, college, because we're, we're, we've been located in college park for 10 years. So college park, personal trainer, um, you Google that you'll end up at me. No problem. Perfect. Sounds good. And we'll put all your social media handles and your website and everything in the link below. 
Um, but otherwise, thank you again for taking time out of your day and helping make Orlando a better place. So thanks again, Ben, and we will definitely be in touch. Thanks, yeah, thanks a lot, Ben. You bet. My pleasure. Robert, we'll see you guys. Yeah.